All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, this is now also on Facebook Live. Um, I'm Dr. Rick Bleicher. I'm the leader of the breast cancer program at Fox States Cancer Center and a breast surgeon. And um, I want to really welcome everybody um, to this uh, Together Facing Breast Cancer event. Um, I want to thank our patients. I want to thank the faculty. I want to thank our caregivers and the advocates and the guests for joining us. Um, uh, you know, tonight, um, my colleagues and I are really looking forward to sharing with you the latest research and treatment developments for breast cancer. Um, people that you're seeing beside me on this field are really um, thought leaders in the field and are true experts. And although we wish that we could be in person for this event like we normally are every year, um, we hope that you'll find this program inspiring and informative from wherever you're joining us from. Um, so we do encourage people to leave questions in the chat if you're you know, familiar with that throughout the program, and then we will get back to that later in the evening. Um, at our events, we usually begin with honoring those that we've lost to breast cancer. So I would uh, ask that people join me for just a moment of silence while we do that. So thank you. I also want to take a moment to thank our exhibitors for the evening. It's really their generous support that allows us to offer this free program to all of you tonight. So I want to thank our gold exhibitors, which include Bristol Myers Squibb, Caris, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Guardian, Natera, Oncosec, Tempest, and Eurogen. Our silver exhibitors are Esai, Eli Lilly, Elucent, Hologic, Novartis, Pfizer, and Puma Biotechnology. And of course, we want to thank Susan G. Komen for the cure, Force, Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and Young Survival Coalition for your ongoing support and partnership, both in the community and generally in the fight against breast cancer. So right now, I want to introduce our panel for the evening. And each of our panelists will be discussing their area of expertise. Um, they're also going to be sharing a PowerPoint presentation on their the area that they're experts in. And so for optimal viewing, I would ask all of you, please turn the volumes on your devices all the way up so you can hear them because some of them are a little bit soft. Um, um, but I want to start first with Megan Boros. Dr. Boros is an assistant professor in our Department of Diagnostic Imaging um, and an expert in breast imaging. So with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Boros and her presentation. The breast is composed of a combination of fat and mixture of fibrous and glandular tissue. Fibroglandular tissue appears white on a mammogram, whereas fat appears gray on a mammogram. Dense breasts have more fibroglandular tissue than fat, and that density can change over time. Breast density is determined by a radiologist who is a doctor such as myself, who will look at the mammogram and determine the pattern of fibroglandular tissue versus fatty tissue. The radiologist assigns the mammogram a density into one of four categories, which are demonstrated here in this figure in green. The first category is called almost entirely fatty, in which the breasts are composed of mainly fatty tissue. An example of this category is the breast to the left side of the screen. As you can see here, it is composed of mostly gray tissue. Approximately 10% of women in the United States have this density. The second category is called scattered areas of fibroglandular density in which the breasts are made of mostly non-dense tissue and have some areas of dense tissue. The third category is called heterogeneously dense in which there are some areas of fatty tissue but the breast is mostly dense. In the US, approximately 40% of women have this density. The fourth category is called extremely dense tissue in which the breasts are composed of mainly dense tissue. An example of this density is the breast to the right of the figure. So what is considered dense? The two categories which are considered dense are heterogeneous tissue and extremely dense tissue. Having dense breast tissue increases one's risk for getting breast cancer. Women with dense breasts have a four to six fold greater risk than women with fatty breasts. A part of this has to do with masking, which I will demonstrate on my next slide. Remember from my first slide how I stated dense tissue appears white on a mammogram? Well, a breast cancer can also appear white. 
If you have more fatty tissue as the breast on the left side of the screen, a cancer is easier to see. However, if you have dense tissue like the breast on the right of the screen, you can see how a cancer, which also appears white, is harder to detect. So now that you have a background on what density is and why it's important, I want to talk about breast density legislation. So first, a little bit of history. In 2003, Dr. Capello, who is a resident of Connecticut, was diagnosed with breast cancer, which was detected on a clinical exam, despite having a normal screening mammogram. This was the first time she learned she had dense breast tissue. She concluded that she may have been diagnosed sooner if she had known about her breast density and could have talked to her doctor about undergoing supplemental screening. She lobbied her state senators to pass legislation requiring surge coverage for supplemental whole breast screening ultrasounds for women with dense breasts. This bill passed in 2005. Then in 2009, the first density notification law was passed, which required direct communication informing the patient of her breast density. Fast forward to 2020, and there are now 38 states, including the District of Columbia, which have breast density notification laws. These are indicated in pink on the map. It is now federal law that the FDA developed breast density reporting language to be included in patient letters, and this exact language is currently being developed. If you notice, some of the states on this map have a black diamond within them, which denotes that the state has mandated insurance coverage for supplemental screening. It's important to note that this does not mean women in states who do not have this mandated insurance coverage cannot have supplemental screening covered by her insurance. This table came from the website densebreastinfo.com and it's part of a larger table listing the aspects of each state's notification law and insurance coverage. If anyone is interested in another state, they can go to the website. In Pennsylvania, in 2014, a density notification law was enacted. Then in 2015, a bill was enacted mandating insurance coverage for digital breast tomosynthesis or 3D mammography. Just recently in August 2020, legislation was passed requiring insurance companies to cover supplemental screening with either breast MRI or screening breast ultrasound for women who have extremely dense breasts, for women who are high risk due to family history or genetic predisposition, or for women who have heterogeneously dense breasts with one other risk factor. Besides a standard 2D mammogram, the following is a list of studies which are currently being used to improve breast cancer detection in women. These include digital breast tomosynthesis, whole breast screening ultrasound, breast MRI, molecular breast imaging, and contrast enhanced mammography. For women with dense breasts or for those who have certain genetic or familial risk factors, supplemental screening can provide an additional means to screen for breast cancer. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I cannot go into details about each one of these, but if you have any questions as to what these are and which may be appropriate for you, you can always talk to your doctor or breast radiologist. So what should you do? It's important to talk to your doctor about your medical history, family history, and your breast density. If your family or personal medical history raises your risk for breast cancer, the risk assessment program at Fox Chase Cancer Center may help you learn more about your total risk. If you have dense breasts, supplemental screening may be helpful. Please note that other supplemental screening tests work in conjunction with mammography, and many cancers are still seen on a mammogram even if you are dense. So it's important to still get your mammogram. Thank you for your time and attention today. If you have any questions, I can answer them during the question and answer portion of this session. Great, thank you, Megan. Um, I'm sure that'll, that's very interesting, very useful information, and I'm sure it's also gonna prompt, probably prompt a lot of questions. Um, so thank you for that. So next we're gonna go to Andrea Porpilia. Andrea did her complex general surgical oncology um, fellowship at Fox Chase, um, a large component of her practice is breast. And so she is now an assistant professor of surgical oncology here at Fox Chase. And so I'll pass it off to her and her presentation. Go over the basics of breast cancer and surgical treatment options. The breast is made of lobules that make the breast milk and ducts that bring the milk to the nipple. In addition, the breast is made up of fat and other connective tissue. 
The two most common types of breast cancer that we see are invasive ductal carcinoma and invasive lobular carcinoma. Often I hear from women are, why me? What did I do and what can I do? Most risk factors you cannot change. The main factors are being a woman and getting older. Other risk factors include genetic mutations, early menstruation, menopause at a later age, and dense breast tissue. Some factors we can control, such as obesity. We know women who are overweight have a higher chance of getting breast cancer than women of a normal weight. Other risk factors include lack of exercise, taking hormone replacement therapy, and drinking alcohol. The stage of the breast cancer and the tumor markers present will guide treatment recommendations. Staging includes size and extent of the tumor, any spread to lymph nodes, if there is spread to distant sites, such as lung, bone, or liver, the grade of the cancer, estrogen receptor status, progesterone receptor status, and HER2 status. Recommendations are made in a multidisciplinary team approach with the surgeons, radiation oncologists, and medical oncologists. Additional testing may be required depending on the stage and patient risk factors. For example, if they have a genetic mutation or are of a young age. Next, I will discuss surgical treatment options. First is what's called a lumpectomy. This is when we remove the cancer with the normal rim of breast tissue around it. Often the cancer is not palpable and we need a guide for us to find the cancer in the breast. For many years, we have been using wires to localize the breast cancer and is still the most widely used option for localization. Some disadvantages to this are patient discomfort, possible wire transection or migration, having to schedule with both radiology and schedule in the operating room on the same day. Now we have technology for localization called wireless localization. Radiologists place a wireless marker in the breast at the site where the cancer is located. This can be done days or weeks prior to the surgery. The marker provides the distance, depth, and direction to the tumor. During the operation, I use an electrocautery device that can locate the marker to remove the cancer. The other option is a mastectomy. This is when we remove the entire breast. There is the option of immediate reconstruction at the time of mastectomy. Two options when we do immediate reconstruction is something called a skin sparing mastectomy, or there is the option of nipple sparing mastectomy. Like it says, we spare the nipple. Both lumpectomy and mastectomy have the same long-term survival. However, discussion of mastectomy versus lumpectomy should be made between the woman and her doctor. There are some instances where one surgery would be recommended over the other based on the tumor characteristics. Lastly, if there are no palpable lymph nodes on exam, we need to assess if there are any microscopic cancer in the axillary lymph nodes. We do this by doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy. The breast gets injected with a radioactive tracer and or a blue dye. This travels to several lymph nodes under the arm. This does not mean the cancer has spread, just telling us if the cancer were to spread, it's gonna to go to these lymph nodes first, and these are the ones we remove and check for cancer. Based on final pathology from surgery, additional therapy may be recommended. The patient will discuss this with their medical oncologist and radiation oncologist. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Great, Andrea. Thank you so much for that. Um, next, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Neil Topham. Um, Neil is a professor in the Department of Surgical Oncology, um, and uh, Neil has a tremendous amount of experience with um, all types of reconstruction, a lot of things that people don't even attempt. Um, he's widely known for that. And so I'll pass it off to Neil and his discussion of reconstruction. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about breast reconstruction at Fox Chase Cancer Center. We have three uh, uh, reconstructive surgeons that perform reconstruction for patients at Fox Chase, and we all do a full spectrum options to reconstruct the patient. When we see a patient in our office, we uh, address these two questions first. What type of reconstruction uh, would we consider and when to have the reconstruction? There are broad categories of, uh, when to, of the types of reconstruction, including a prosthetic implant, an implant prosthesis, autologous tissue from the abdomen, oncoplasty procedures used for lumpectomy to reconstruct the breast, and 
when we consider when to have reconstruction, there's immediate and delayed. Immediate means that the breast is reconstructed at the time of mastectomy, and delayed means that we choose to reconstruct the breast after the mastectomy has been per performed and the wounds have healed. Here's our philosophy at Fox Chase when we consider breast reconstruction. Uh, we choose the best reconstruct reconstructive option with our patients. It seems simple and it seems unusual that that would be it, but uh, many places do not offer, offer the full spectrum of reconstructive options for patients, and patients only receive the reconstructive option that their plastic surgeon is proficient in. Um, and so we choose simply to choose what best fits the patient and working with them. So what are these options that uh, are the considerations that we have to consider when we see a patient as they come into our office? First of all, what are the patient expectations? Uh, they may have a desire not to have reconstruction, just to have the chest wall shaped after mastectomy. Uh, to people who really want the perfect uh, implant, they come in with pictures and ask us to uh, try to achieve the results, and those can be very high expectations. We consider the patient's physical appearance, their breast size and shape, the weight that the patient uh, carries, the scars, their location of the scars, and the quality of the skin uh, that at this site of the reconstruction. We consider their cancer treatment, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and unilateral versus bilateral reconstruction. Radiation therapy is probably the biggest factor here in choosing the type of reconstruction for a patient. Now this is basically our shopping list of the places that we can go to uh, on the body to reconstruct uh, the breast. First off is the abdomen. This is where most of our free tram and microsurgery is performed using uh, tram flaps from the abdomen. And then there are also deep flaps and SIE, SIEP flaps. These are just versions of the same thing in the way we raise the blood vessels. But we can also go to the thigh or buttock to transfer tissue to reconstruct the breast. And then there's implant-based reconstruction where we use um, foreign uh, material with saline or silicone implants to reconstruct the breast. We can also use a combination including um, latissimus dorsi flap where this is transferred from the back to the breast to reconstruct the breast and we can use it with or without an implant. We're very proficient at microsurgery here at Fox Chase. Commonly this comes from the abdomen. You see the dotted line there and it can be used to reconstruct one breast or both breasts. This is an example of the uh, repair that we do to connect the vessels together. You can see how fine the sutures are and this has blood flowing through it. Here's an example of a, a, court, a patient after surgery is completed and she had nipple sparing surgery and it was reconstructed with tissue from her abdominal wall for both breasts. And you can see that the contour is excellent both on her abdominal wall and on both breasts and that the texture is also uh, the same as a native breast. This is one of the major advantages of using the patient's own tissue. Here's another example where we're matching uh, the patient's right side uh, and reconstructing the patient's left side. And here we left the nipple off. I'll show you in just a minute with the nipple on, but I want to show you a comparison of the shape of the breast and the difference that a nipple makes in a person after the reconstruction. Uh, here we've reconstructed the nipple and applied a tattoo and you can see the symmetry that she has. Here's another patient with uh, both breasts reconstructed with um, uh, tissue from the abdominal wall and nipple reconstruction and tattooing. Implant-based reconstruction is probably the most common actually when you look at all the numbers of the reconstructive types that we perform. It's commonly done in a two-stage process where tissue expansion is done by placing an an expander at the time of the uh, mastectomy and it's, the expansion is done weekly for six weeks and then we exchange that with a permanent implant that has a better texture and is softer at about 12 weeks. But implants can also be put in right at the same time as the mastectomy. It's done less commonly. It's also a newer technique but this is called direct to implant where uh, you place the full implant in underneath the pectoralis muscle or sometimes we place it above the pectoralis muscle. This is called a pre-pectoralis uh, implant. Here's some examples of the implant where um, 
her reconstruction is completed. And you can see this is a two-stage reconstruction with the nipples reconstructed uh, with a tattoo only and shading done to emphasize the nipple. Another patient who has had implants placed and you can see that typically implant patients are thinner, they don't have a donor site for the abdominal wall, and she has a very flattering result um, and looks excellent in clothes. Here's an example of the latissimus dorsi flap where we harvest the muscle and skin from the back and rotate it under the armpit to cover the breast. This is often used in radiated patients and is used in combination with an implant. So it's a combination of using the patient's own tissue and using the implant itself. This patient had a latissimus dorsi flap placed and you can see the symmetry that she's received to match her opposite side. At Fox Chase we also uh, are pioneering lymphedema surgery in patients who've had axillary dissection. Uh, we can and have lymphedema in one extremity. We can perform lymphovenous bypass where we attach two small vessels together to drain the lymphatic fluid out of the arm and bring it into the uh, venous system where it's circulated out of the arm. Or we can transfer lymph nodes uh, from other parts of the body and act as a filter to assist in uh, transferring the uh, lymph, lymph fluid out of the arm or leg, wherever the case may be. This is an example of the vessels before they're attached. It's super microsurgery, so these very fine sutures are placed to get these vessels attached to each other. And here's after the attachment, and you can see that there's dye flowing through showing the, uh, the patency. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you about breast reconstruction. If you have any uh, questions, please do not hesitate to contact my office or my colleagues. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate that very much. Um, always very interesting um, and insightful, and people uh, always learn a lot um, you know, about the various reconstruction types because it's something that many of us don't often know about. Um, we're, I'm next want to introduce my colleague, um, Elias Obeid. Um, Dr. Obeid um, really has two roles, um, both in the Department of Clinical Genetics and also as the interim chief in the Division of Breast Medical Oncology. Um, he's an assistant professor here at Fox Chase and has been here for many years. So with that, let me introduce and pass it off to Dr. Obeid. Thank you, Dr. Blacher, for giving us the opportunity to discuss some of the new developments in breast cancer this year. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this year's event, Together Facing Breast Cancer. Uh, my name is Galaya Sobid, and uh, I'm one of the medical oncologists who treats breast cancer at Fox Chase. Uh, today, I wanted to give you some um, updates on some of the newer treatment that are available for women uh, with breast cancer. As you all probably uh, remember, breast cancer is not one type uh, of cancer. It is, we look at breast cancer as either having hormone receptors, we call that hormone receptor or HR positive breast cancer, uh, HER2 positive uh, breast cancer. Uh, there might be some overlap between HER2 positive and Homo receptor positive, and then we have the third subtype, which is triple negative breast cancer. Some of the new therapies for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer have been the CDK46 inhibitors. Some of you have seen those either in the clinics or in advertisement on TV. They have been in development and have been around for patients since uh, around mid. 2015 and over the last few years there have been three drugs of the same family uh, palbociclib, ribociclib and abemaciclib uh, that have been approved for the treatment of the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer in the metastatic setting meaning cancer that has recurred or has already spread and uh, is not curable but can be controlled with those medications when combined with hormone therapy. The other uh, new targeted drug for hormone receptor positive is the PIK3CA inhibitor. Uh, the brand name is Alpilisib. So just an overview, CDK46 inhibition, it actually blocks the cancer cells from dividing. It actually is similar to putting your foot on the brake, making making sure that once 
the drug is given, it pushes the cancer cells towards some kind of cell death because they cannot divide anymore. Again, it's given with a hormonal treatment. Those are the three drugs. I mentioned them all that you can find in the handout. I mentioned the other drug that has been approved in May 2019. So this is relatively new. It's a new drug that is targets the PIK3CA mutation. Some of you have seen the advertisement. It's called PIKRAY. It is uh, also given with hormone treatment uh, in the metastatic setting. Uh, patients, a uh, tumor, again, the tumor cells should have this mutation in the PIK3A gene in order to get some benefit from this drug. Now, in the triple negative breast cancer, uh, there are three different things that we will talk about. The first one is the, homo the, the immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is when we give a biologic drug that uses the person's immune system to fight, to boost it, to fight cancer that in previous years and uh, about a year and a half ago this got approved at the uh, it's given along with uh, chemo a chemotherapy drug called napaclitaxel or abraxane but the breast cancer that is triple negative should also be positive for a bi biomarker so it's a protein in the tumor cells called pdl1 uh, in order to benefit from this treatment a new drug that was approved recently in April 2020, so relatively very new, uh, it's called an antibody drug conjugate, meaning there's, it's a biologic drug and a small molecule of chemotherapy attached to it. Uh, and this drug also is approved for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Um, and it has really good responses. and. Uh, uh, you know, that's why it has been approved uh, by the FDA. Uh, recently, a, just about a month and a half ago, a clinical trial showed uh, it to be superior to chemotherapy, uh, even in patients who've had at least two lines of treatment or two different uh, regimens of treatment in the metastatic setting for triple negative cancer. A drug that has been in the market for a while, uh, actually there are two of them, but those are specific for patients who have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Uh, again, those target those particular tumors in women who have the BRCA mutations. Now, in her two positive breast cancer, there have been two different clinical trials that have been published in the last uh, probably about uh, nine or ten months ago, and two drugs have been approved in that. Uh, uh, one is called tucatinib. It was approved in April 2020, also is new. It's given along with trastuzumab, also known as Herceptin, and a chemotherapy oral drug called capecitabine or Zaloda has really good responses. You can see here the curves, how they separate, and those are the women who got the drug combination uh, versus the typical uh, Herceptin or Trastuzumab with Zaloda. And uh, the last drug is ER2, which is another antibody drug conjugate, also approved end of December 2019. You can see how much of you know tumor responses. You can see about 61% of the patients would have some kind of treatment. So this really highlights the importance of clinical research. At Fox Chase, we do a lot of clinical trials. Uh, one of them is for combining chemotherapy with immunotherapy. And the other one is combining immunotherapy with trastuzumab and chemotherapy for her two positive breast cancer. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. So thank you, Elias. Um, um, and before I introduce my next guest, I want to give people just an idea. The order of the of our speakers and our faculty today were primarily in the order, almost in the order of treatment. So. We started out with Dr. Boris, who did diagnostic imaging. We did Dr. Porpilia, who did breast surgery, Dr. Topham, who did plastics, Dr. Abid, who did medical oncology. And now I want to introduce Dr. Anderson. Um, Dr. Anderson is a professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology, and she's also the chief of the Division of Breast and Gynecologic Radiation Oncology. And so Penny's going to talk to us a little bit about advances in radiotherapy. Thank you very much, Rick. So when we think of breast cancer treatment, we want to know the impact a particular treatment will have on our patients. For example, how it would affect the patient in terms of the efficacy of the treatment, 
as well as the toxicity and side effects it may produce, both short-term and long-term, which of course translates to the quality of life of our patients. And also we want to know about the duration of the treatment course itself. So we have an abundance of data that demonstrates the effectiveness of radiation to the breast and axillary lymph nodes in improving both local control and survival. So this course of treatment has always been a standard course of about six to six and a half weeks of radiation to the breast region. But recently there has been a lot of robust published literature that demonstrate that radiation can be delivered in a shorter period of time, that is less number of days and therefore a fewer number of weeks of treatment compared to our longer treatment regimen. So here at Fox Chase, we've implemented this shorter course of treatment, which is called hypofractionation. In other words, a less number of fractions of the daily population treatments. And at Fox Chase, we now routinely offer this shorter course of treatment, which is about only 20 treatments total, or about four weeks, as opposed to six or even six and a half weeks of treatment that historically we've been, we've been using. And this has greatly impacted our patients' lives and the quality of life with regards to their treatment. And this, uh, hypofractionated treatment approach can be offered for invasive disease as well as for um, non-invasive or DCIS patients as well. And we presented this data from um, treating with hypofractionation uh, to many um, outside meetings nationwide and we have demonstrated that there is equal efficacy between the shorter course of radiation and the longer more conventional radiation. But just as important as the efficacy is toxicity of treatment or the side effect profile. So we've demonstrated that this four week regimen resulted in similar side effects as uh, when compared to the longer course of radiation. And it's been proven that this shorter treatment course is equal to the longer conventional course. And therefore, hypofractionation has actually become the new standard of care in the treatment of many breast cancer cases. But another very important um, issue is in regards to radiation treatments to the left side of the body when people have left-sided breast cancer since the heart is on the left side of the body. So when planning for this radiation, we need to take into account the radiation dose that the heart might get when treating the left breast or left chest wall region. And our goal is to avoid the heart at all costs since there is a great body of literature that actually demonstrates that radiation dose to the heart can lead to late cardiac toxicity. So our goal is to minimize the heart dose and we use very sophisticated treatment planning programs and systems to calculate the radiation dose to the normal organs like the heart in order to avoid it. While at the same time, we deliver the needed dose to the breast, chest wall, and lymph nodes in order to cover appropriately the patient's cancer. So here at Fox Chase, we've implemented that technique called deep inspiration breath hold, or DIBH, where we actually have the patients inhale and hold their breath uh, during beam on time so we can calculate and determine if their actual motion of breathing in and what's entailed is the patients hold their breath during the radiation beam on time during their treatments to minimize and avoid any radiation dose or exposure to the heart. So this is just a, a pictorial of a patient, um, it's a CT scan and as you can see on the left that represents free breathing so you can see the heart in the middle of the chest and then when you, in relation to the breasts and when you take a look at the picture on the right with a deep inspiration breath hold the heart is actually pulled out of the field away from the radiation beam and the breast area. Better yellow represents the radiation beam so again on the left in the free breathing position you can see the heart or that orange part is actually part of the heart that's in the radiation beam thereby getting radiation exposure to the heart um, organ itself or on the right um, when the patient takes deep inspiration breath hold, you can see how the heart is pulled away and it's out of that yellow radiation beam, thereby minimizing and avoiding uh, radiation dose to the heart. So we've, our department, um, in order to do the uh, deep inspiration breath hold, we have installed the newest, latest, and greatest technology to assist in deep inspiration breath hold, which is called Vision RT. And Vision RT is an alignment technology system that allows us to verify and check and make sure that our breast cancer patients are in the most accurate optimal treatment position before and during their entire radiation treatment. So the patient undergoes daily real-time surface tracking to ensure their proper position throughout the course of their radiation treatments. And this daily alignment uh, for the RT positioning system generates information regarding their daily positional variations prior to and during their entire treatment delivery. So by having the patient in the proper treatment position that was determined at the time of their planning, um, we were able to safely and accurately deliver the radiation treatment effectively while avoiding the normal tissue structures that we want to avoid during radiation. So here at Fox Chase, we use this Vision RT alignment technology 
not only for left-sided breast cancers, but also for our right-sided breast cancer patients, again, in order to adequately and accurately maximize the accuracy of our daily radiation treatments that we offer our patients. So in summary, we have made great strides in improving the patient's quality of life in terms of shortening the overall treatment of, I'm sorry, shortening the overall length of treatment time. Also, we decreased toxicity and side effects, specifically cardiac toxicity, while at the same time maintaining the excellent high rates of local control and the improved outcomes with our radiation treatments for our breast cancer patients. So thank you very much for your time and attention this evening. Okay, great. And our faculty are gonna come back online. Um, visibly. So thank you all for those excellent talks. Um, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. And, um, you know, if you haven't already, you can certainly just comment on Facebook Live with your questions, and um, we will get those questions, and then we will try to answer as many as we can in the time that we have. So the first question, I think, um, you know, is one which we've already, we've gotten a few already. Um, I think this first one I'm going to um, direct towards Dr. Obeid. Um, so this person, this individual says, my question after two years of my treatments, I'm on tamoxifen for three more years. What is the proper term to say when a person is cancer free or is there a proper term? Elias, you wanna hit that up? Yeah, so thank you for the, for the question. So if somebody was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer that's hormone receptor positive, they are expected to continue on treatment with a hormonal treatment, either tamoxifen or another drug uh, of the family called aromatase inhibitors. So technically, I always tell patients, you're cancer-free once you're, you don't have any cancer that is visible to us uh, on imaging, and we know that the cancer was taken out by the surgeon. Uh, we don't know when the cancer or if the cancer is going to come back. Now, if the question is, if somebody is on treatment when the cancer has recurred already and they require to be on tamoxifen or another drug permanently, uh, so that would be a different uh, situation. We would say that it's a controlled disease, but the cancer is not totally out of the body. Great, thank you, Elias. Um, Megan, this one is for you. Um, should both MRIs and conventional mammograms be given? When should they be given? Um, how should it, how, how, when should somebody have a 3D mammogram? How often should they be administered to a survivor and should a survivor receive both? So it's a lot in there, if you can maybe yeah. summarize some of that. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> um, so let me just start off with a mammogram. So um, the American College of Radiology, um, as well as American Cancer Society, we recommend that women start getting their mammogram at age 40. And that's a yearly thing. So patients should still get their mammogram um, every year. Um, Getting digital breast tomosynthesis or a 3D mammogram is also something that you can discuss um, with your breast radiologist as well. And um, it's data showing now that that digital breast tomosynthesis may be beneficial for reducing something called a callback, meaning something that a radiologist see that may be abnormal and it may just be superimposition of tissue. So that 3D mammogram kind of helps us um, scroll through areas of the breast, which may just be tissue. So if you have denser tissue, digital breast tomosynthesis can be a benefit. And that is also just given as your yearly mammogram. In terms of MRI, and if you should receive supplemental screening with MRI, that's also something that you can discuss with your breast radiologist based on your family history and your personal medical history as well. Um, currently, the American Cancer Society recommends that if you do have a BRCA mutation, either one or two, you get supplemental screening in addition to your mammogram. If you have a first degree relative that also has a BRCA mutation and you yourself are untested, you would qualify for that additional supplemental screening. If you have a lifetime risk of breast cancer calculated to be greater than 20%, which is based on certain models, then we would recommend that you get supplemental screening with breast MRI in addition to your mammogram. And there's other things such as radiation to the test between um, ages 10 and 30 years of age and different syndromes, which may predispose you to getting a breast cancer. And with supplemental screening, we recommend that you get that MRI. And typically what happens is you'll get your mammogram and then six months later, you will get that supplemental breast MRI. And it's kind of almost being looked at twice a year instead of just at your annual mammogram. 
And as I was saying with my talk, it's good um, to get both because they kind of work in conjunction with each other and they look at different things. And the breast MRI is sensitive for detecting um, things that may not be seen on your mammogram. Great, thank you, Dr. Boros. Dr. Neil Topham, I've got a, a plastic surgeon and reconstruction question for you. Okay. So how often should someone with breast implants get them replaced? And is that typically paid for by insurance? Uh, first off, yes. If you've had implants placed for breast reconstruction, the insurance company will cover the cost without much problem. Um, in terms of when should implants be replaced, it depends on the type of implant that you have. So there's two categories. One is saline. Saline implants can last for 15 or 20 years. Uh, the way we replace those and the timing for replacement for those is when they rupture because when they rupture, they collapse and you know they rupture and that's when you replace them. At least in my practice, that's how I do it. If it's silicone filled, then the company says that the implant is good for about 10 years. On a physical examination, you can't tell whether the implant is ruptured or not. So we often follow that with an MRI or ultrasound. And if an implant has the MRI or ultrasound every, done every three years and it's successfully uh, lasted for about 10 years, then at that point we exchange them. So the answer is it either for saline, it doesn't have to be changed until it ruptures. For sil for silicone, it should be changed probably about every 10 years. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Penny Anderson, I have one for you. Someone who actually knows a lot of lingo actually has asked, is the breathing technique that you've described also done while patients are in the prone or so people understand face down position as well? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is no. Um, they kind of, uh, maybe take the place of each other. Some institutions, um, excuse me, could use the prone position where the person is lying face down, which might help pull the heart out of the radiation beam, but it's hard to actually hold your breath while you're on your belly. So both those things are usually not done in combination. Wonderful. Um, all right, let's see. Um, another one here for... Uh, for Dr. Obeid, um, please address the side effects of aromatase inhibitors and treatment. So aromatase inhibitors are notorious for causing hot flashes in women. Uh, they also can cause joint pain and uh, stiffness in the joint. Uh, that uh, sometimes it becomes hard for some women to tolerate. Now, in my experience, and I think also if you stand for many other best oncologists would tell you that the hot flashes come, you know, early on in the process of treatment, and most of the women who take the aromatase inhibitors would end up uh, having less uh, hot flashes. In some instances, they don't necessarily continue to have them. Um, and in terms of the joint aches and stiffness in the joint, it can sometimes take a period of time before it develops. Uh, and that's why we always tell women to exercise regularly, especially with uh, weight bearing and, and resistance training types of exercises that tend to stimulate the joints and avoid that kind of stiffness and pain. One other side effect is the, the, the bone, bone loss, or we call it the bone density loss. Uh, so women may end up having either osteopenia or osteoporosis, that's fragile bones, basically. And we usually tell them to be on calcium and vitamin D, and we monitor the bone density on a regular basis as long as they are on the aromatase inhibitors. Great, thank you, Dr. Obeid. Um, Dr. Porpelia, we have a question for you. Um, when you see a patient, what are the factors that you use to make the decision about whether a patient should have a lumpectomy or a mastectomy performed? That's a very good question. Uh, there are several factors that we look at. So one is the size of the tumor. If the woman has a smaller breast or uh, the tumor is greater than uh, five centimeters, the control rate is not, as, uh, is not as good. So we recommend mastectomy in those cases. If it's in multiple parts of the breast, um, then we do not recommend lumpectomy, but rather mastectomy. Uh, if a patient has um, some genetic mutations, they may opt for mastectomy, but does not mean they have to have one, but some women who are younger may choose to have a mastectomy versus a lumpectomy. 
They've also had previous radiation. We recommend them not typically to get uh, re-radiation and get a lumpectomy at that, at that time. Great, thanks very much. Um, okay, moving on. Um, I'm gonna send this one back to Dr. Obeid. Um, this says, hello, I'm a breast cancer patient in remission. My concern is early detection of met metastasis. I've heard about an FDA approved blood test for circulating tumor cells. Would you do this test at intervals so that I don't have to worry about metastasis with every ache and pain? Or how do you detect early metastatic disease? So this is a great question. There has been a lot of uh, discussions as well as research in the area of circulating tumor cells. For those who don't necessarily know what that means, circulating tumor cells, we believe that when somebody has metastatic cancer, that the cancer cells or the tumor would release some of the cells into the bloodstream. And there are certain uh, laboratories that can measure that. Now, while this is a way to, to determine whether or not there are some cancer cells in the bloodstream. It has not really materialized into telling us whether somebody, when we detect that, would live longer or we would do any different intervention. Having said that, there are newer technology now that's not looking just at the cells, but looking at circulating tumor DNA. So it's even easier and even better to detect that. But so far, it's not yet in clinical practice. And in the United States, we do not rely on circulating tumor cells to detect whether or not it has metastatic uh, cancer. We worry about something called lead time bias, meaning detecting something that we don't necessarily need to know about at this particular moment, because we don't necessarily have any intervention to help uh, change the course of the illness. So for, for now, uh, we don't necessarily uh, recommend doing that test, at least in the United States. Great, thank you, Elias. Um, uh, Dr. Boros, back to you. Um, this, uh, this individual has asked, um, she says, I was diagnosed at 36. Is it still recommended that my daughter start getting mammograms at age 26 or has that changed? So um, the recommendation is that you kind of subtract 10 years from the age at which your first degree relative um, was diagnosed. And we recommend starting getting the mammogram at age 30, so not at age 26. Um, so she can start getting her mammograms um, at age 30. And then she can also even, you can have her, if you want, talk to like our folks in the risk assessment, assessment program um, who are very good and they can go over her calculated lifetime risk and discuss um, possibly being observed in another, using another type of modality such as MRI if she needs it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Dr. Porpelia, back to you. Is it necessary to avoid blood pressures and blood draws on the affected side to avoid lymphedema? That's a really good question as well. Um, so typically for, if you have what's called an axillary lymph node dissection, so all the lymph nodes are removed under the arm, we do recommend no blood pressures, uh, no, IV draw, no IVs, or no lab draws. Um, we do, there's been data that shows there's increased risk of lymphedema if you do that. However, with sentinel lymph node biopsy, there's not as great data for it. We still recommend it, um, especially for blood pressure. Occasional lab draw, um, we say if you can avoid it, you should, uh, but if you need to, then you can get uh, blood draws in that arm. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Boros, we're, we're back, to, uh, back to you again. Um, did I hear correctly that the first doctor mentioned that people with extremely dense breast tissue are four to six times more likely to develop breast cancer? I guess the question is sort of talk to us a little bit about dense breasts and you know, um, what you, how you counsel your patients who, who in fact, once they've had their mammograms and they in fact do have very dense breasts, what do you generally tell them? So um, just having dense breasts, a part of that risk is having to do with what's called masking, which is kind of demonstrated in that video that I showed in my PowerPoint and how that if you have dense tissue, which also shows up as white on your mammogram, a cancer, which is, can also show up white, can be masked um, and you can't see that cancer is all in kind of the um, analogy I like to use is finding a specific snowflake in a snowstorm, so to speak. So that masking has a part to do with um, not being able to detect that cancer on your mammogram, but also having dense breasts in itself is also a risk. 
Um, so, you know, if a woman does have dense breasts, we talk to them about getting supplemental screening um, with either whole breast screening ultrasound um, or breast MRI as well, which can be helpful in detecting those cancers that necessarily aren't seen on that mammogram. Great. Um, all right. Um, this one actually goes back. I'm going to ask, I'll ask this one to Penny, although she can turf this one if she wants to. <laughs> So we have somebody who asks, should soy be avoided in their diet? What do you tell people if they would, a patient that would ask you that? That's a great question. And uh, I will turn it back to you, but I'll answer. Um, we, in general, I tell people, I don't know if they have to avoid, soy is in a lot of products, which I didn't realize I actually did research myself for, for certain patients to find out, you know, it's in a lot of things from salad dressings um, to, you know, lots of uh, processed products as well as your typical soy burger. So I tell people to, because if, if they're ER positive and the risk of, of the thought of soy being, you know, estrogen positive, I tell people to maybe avoid a solely soy based diet, which might be difficult for people who are vegetarian and things like that. But um, I don't tell them to avoid totally soy. I think it's almost impossible in this country, to be honest. Yeah. And I actually, I also say to patients, everything in moderation, um, you know, if you've got a receptor positive breast cancer, if you're living on soy, maybe that's not a great idea. But Elias, what do you tell your patients regarding soy and who, let's say somebody who has got a receptor positive breast cancer? I totally agree with that. I usually tell them everything in moderation. I don't uh, recommend uh, somebody to take mega doses of soy supplements or completely soy, uh, you know, uh, diet. But, you know, in moderation, if somebody is eating, let's say, sushi and they want to have some soy sauce on the side, absolutely. I don't think there is a reason not to, to take that. Wonderful. Um, all right. Well, that was the last question. Unless there's any more that we happen to get within the next couple seconds. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to thank the faculty. Um, let me just, you know, say we really appreciate everybody's tuning in on Facebook Live tonight. Um, if you want to revisit any of the slides from the evening, this has been recorded um, and it'll be available on our Facebook and our YouTube pages. Um, we also really want to thank our exhibitors who have supported us and allowed us to bring this to everybody out there, um, you know, without cost. Um, we want to thank our survivors, of course, who sent in pictures and um, lots of words of encouragement. And I really want to thank everybody who's been here to share their expertise. Dr. Megan Boros, Dr. Andrew Porpelia, Dr. Neil Topham, um, uh, Dr. Elias Obeid, Dr. Penny Anderson. Um, there are two together facing events taking place virtually in November, um, lung cancer on November 5th and pancreatic cancer on November 19th. So please check our Facebook page and our website for more information. And of course, we really do look forward to the day when we can all do this in person. Um, we do this every year. So hopefully whether we have to do it virtually or whether we have, we get to do it in person, we look forward to seeing all of you next year. Right now we're going to see little bit of a, a slideshow, but um, this essentially concludes um, the informational part of our event. So thank you very much.